Okay, so welcome to College Algebra. Um, so any questions about the logistics of the course, the various homework assignments that are due, and quizzes, and everything else? Yes? Me? Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. sorry, I thought you were looking over there. Um, for the online thing, our login is supposed to be all those numbers, and it stays up? Yes, okay. crazy letters and numbers thing, okay. yes. Other questions? So I sent out an email just to remind you what the, what the story is, right? So at present, you have, you have three kinds of assignments that are, that are open for business, right? You have, um, you have online homeworks that you do on WebAssign. Okay? You have um, written homeworks that you download, print, and you do it, and then you need to bring it to lecture and turn it in at the beginning of lecture on the due date. So for example, there are three exercises due Monday, five days from now. Really two, because one of them is just a, a nothing. Yes? Right, there are, there are also two due on Wednesday. And at this point, there are five posted. Zero, one, two, three, and four. Yes? Um, for the quiz, they said that the window is till Friday. Yes. What, what time on Friday is it just I, I don't know I don't know that, but what you need to do is you need to sign up for a time. Okay. So when you go to the web page, uh, you'll have the option to select a time, and that that that's the the deadline. So wh okay, whatever the uh, whatever the latest time is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. What's the best way to show our work for the online assignments? Uh, well, so generally speaking, the best way to show your work is the way that I show my work in class, and I haven't done much of that, so. You'll just have to see. And then the second thing is that uh, maybe you're wondering or asking, do you need to sh d will I be checking your work on the online assignments? And the answer is no. I will not be checking your work on the, on the web assigned stuff. I is that what you're asking? Uh, no, I was just asking how best to show it. I assumed you would be checking. Yeah, so on the online homework, the web assigned stuff, not, I'm, I'm not checking your work. Uh, and that has to do with labor, <laughs> right? There's just not enough labor to go around uh, to do that. But we will be checking your, your written homework, which is why there's you know, approximately 10 web assign exercises, but there's just two <laughs> per, per, uh, per lecture written homework exercises. Other questions? OK, <clears throat> so, so today is Uh, the 24th. Um, <clears throat> so last time we were talking about uh, sets of numbers. So what sets of numbers did we talk about? Right. The reals, the naturals, the integers. Okay. And the quotients. And the rationals. Yeah, good. Very good. So last time I made a claim that um, <coughs> there, there are numbers that are not the ratio of two integers. And this is kind of a, a serious, I hope, you, I hope you take it to be a serious claim because essentially every number you've ever de dealt with in your life is expressible as the ratio of two integers. Right? So for example, I ate five out of the eight pieces of pizza. So that's five over eight. Or you know, there, there are zero statues of liberty inside of this classroom. Uh, that's zero over one, right? So essentially every number you've ever dealt with is rational. Uh, so it may be surprising for me to tell you that there are numbers that cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers. So <clears throat> I'm going to make a proposition and I'm going to prove it. And the proposition is that the square root of 2 is not in the rationals. So now, <clears throat> I'm going to prove this. And before I do it, I'm going to just forewarn you. This, this is a little bit of a complicated math argument. And you may, you may have difficulty following it at times, maybe. I hope not. I hope to explain it clearly. But you should know I'm not going to test you over it. The purpose is, th there's two purposes for me doing this. One is that 
this is a university level math course and if I make a claim like there are numbers that are not rational then I need to back that up and second part of the reason is is that it's it's a good way to sort of introduce you to math culture right just what do mathematicians do right uh, and b believe it or not we don't we don't go back to our office and just add numbers right <laughs> all the time <laughs> right. okay <clears throat> so we're gonna prove this so we're going to assume the contrary the contrary position which is to say let's assume that the square root of 2 in fact is rational that it is p over q for some p and q which are in the integers that the denominator q is not zero and the last thing that I need that's the important one I'll write in red is that and p and q have no common factors so what does that mean that they have no common factors what do you think okay well that that's one so for example how about here's a rational three over four the numerator is three and the denominator is four do they share any common factors no besides one but one doesn't count okay how about 75 over 100 ah they have a common factor of 25 if you factor that out and cancel then what is the result three over four right so I'm talking about let's any rational can be simplified to, to the point where the numerator and denominator have no common factors. It is always possible to achieve this. Okay, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's called reduced form. Okay, so here we're going to assume this. So I'll take this equation. Square root of 2 is p over q. I'm going to multiply both sides by q. So if I multiply both sides by q, then I have q square root 2 is p. If I multiplied both sides by q. Now I'm going to square both sides. So that q square root 2 squared is p squared. Hey, everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. So now now we want to do we want to care, simplify the left hand side when you do that what what does the square do to each factor it distributes to each one right so this will be q squared and then square root 2 squared is p squared okay and then now the real question is depending on your on your prior experience what is the square root of 2 squared? It's 2, it's two right? So this is, this is q squared multiplied by 2 equal to p squared. And just because you're probably used to it, I'm going to write the 2 in front. 2q two squared is p squared. Everybody with me to here? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> as a result, so I'm writing this symbol right here. So this, this symbol right here is a math symbol that is, in English anyway, pronounced therefore. For those of you that like to know technical language, this, this symbol is called the entailment symbol. It means that as a result of, of what happened before, it is a consequence that the following things I'm going to write. So we have p squared is 2 multiplied by q squared. Okay. So now, that means that p squared is 2 multiplied by something. And every integer is either even or odd. So how about q squared? 
Uh, sorry, how about p squared, I mean to say? p squared must be even, because p squared is 2 multiplied by something. Right? So as a consequence of what we've just argued, p squared must be even. Now, can we make any conclusion about p itself? We know that p squared is even. How about p? Well, let's consider for a moment. Can someone give me an example of an even number? Eight. Okay, okay, eight, <laughs> besides two, right? So eight is even. How about eight squared, what's that? 64, 64. is it even? Yes. yes. Okay. That, is, that is true for any even. If you take an even and you square it, the result is still even. How, okay, now will someone please give me an odd number? Seven. Seven, and seven squared is? 49. 49. Is 49 even or odd? odd? It's odd. That is generally also true. You square an odd number, the result is still odd. So squaring preserves evenness and oddness. So if p squared is even, then how about p? It, also it must also be even. OK, now at this point, some of you may be feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> Right, about, about this argument. And I'd like to remind you that you're not going to be tested over it. Okay. So, so that I don't lo lo lose you <laughs> emotionally, right? D disengage from the course. Uh, okay. I'm so, no, that's just, I just, okay. that's just a little P that grew a little tail or something. Here, I'll, I'll rewrite it. So p is even, okay? And then as a result of that, that means that p is 2d for some d, right? That's, what it, that's part of what it means to be even. So 16 is even because it can be written as 2 times 8. 100 is even because it can be written as 2 times 50. The fact that that p is even means it can be written as 2 times something. So now I'm going to take this equation. I'm going to take this. And I'm going to plug it into here. I'm going to plug it into here. So I'm going to take this equation. Just copy it first. So 2q squared. Uh, is p squared. And so what do I mean I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to substitute that in? I'm going to replace p with 2d. So 2q squared is 2d squared. So I replace the p with a 2d. And now let's, let's multiply out the right hand side. So how about that? What do you get when you do that? 2 squared, d squared, 4d squared, 4d squared. Uh, so now there's a common factor on both sides of the equation. What common factor? 2. 2 is common to both sides. So I can divide by 2 and obtain that q squared, q squared is 2d squared. And I hope you're having a little bit of deja vu because we were, just, we were just at a position that was just like this. So we can now make a, make a conclusion. What can we conclude? Yes, we, so I'll, I'll do the intermediate conclusion. So as a result, q squared is even, right, because q squared is 2 times something. But we already said, we already observed that if a square is even, then the original thing is even also. So what, what is also even? Q is even. And therefore, Q is equal to 2 multiplied by A for some A. But this is a real problem now. This couldn't possibly be the case. Why not? Why could this not possibly be the case? 
So there's a reason somewhere at the top. That's right. So we said that, well, maybe the square root of 2 is, is irrational. Maybe it is. Maybe it's the ratio of two integers. Then we can arrange it so that those two integers have no common factors. But as a consequence of, of that, we have established that, in fact, they, they do have common factors. <laughs> what common factor do they have? Two. two. They're both even. But this cannot be the case. So this is a contradiction. A contradiction to the initial assumption that they have no common factors. So the only, because everything between the initial assumption and here was correct, the only possible mathematical conclusion is that the initial assumption in the first place must be false. Therefore, square root of 2 is not in the quotients. Wow. OK. So cu a couple things to take away from this. So just to remind you for the third time now, you won't be tested over this argument. Okay. Th but I have now established in class that there are numbers that are not rational. Okay, and here square root of two is one of them. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'd like for you to understand is that uh, if you consider the set of real numbers, the set of real numbers, because of your experience in life and because of essentially every number you've ever dealt with has, be ra has been rational, you might believe that there's lots of rationals, that maybe, maybe even most of the numbers are rational. But in fact, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. If you were to take the, the set of real numbers and you were to put them all in a bag, say, and if you could reach into the bag and pull out a number, but you didn't know which one you were going to pick, and you had equal probability of choosing any one of them, if you were to do that, you have 0% probability that you would choose a rational number. You have 100% probability that you would pick a number that isn't. So you could, if you could carry out that procedure now, if we were to just take all the reels, put them all in a bag, and you just start pulling out numbers and checking to see if they're rational, you could do that from now until forever, and you'll never get one. So that's interesting. OK. Now, if you, didn't, if you do not like this, what, we, what we've done on this page. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But that probably means that um, you, you, you're not ready to be a math major, <laughs> you know, in, in a sense. You know. don't, don't let me discourage you. But let me say it like this. If you, if you like this, if you thought, wow, that was, that was excellent, okay, consider being a math major. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay. Yes? Um. Well, it it's not a random number, but the, f the fact that P is even means that you could write P as 2 multiplied by something. Okay. So, like, 1,000 is even. Why is 1,000 even? Yeah, because you can write it as 2 times 500. Right. So I'm saying that P is even, so it's 2 multiplied by something. Okay. I don't know what that something is, but it's something. Yes? So when you were talking about um, you can only like, pick any number and you can keep doing this and keep mm -hmm. doing it forever, so would you like take the number and just apply it to this? No, just check, right? Is it, is it, ra is it, I picked a number from the reals. Is it also in the rationals? Mm -hmm. And the answer, the, the answer, if you're, cho if you're choosing uniformly, randomly, then the answer will be no. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> okay, so now. Um, definitions. Let x be in the reals and n in the naturals. First definition, in x. So in, I'll write the dot, right? However, you should know that 
the the dot i mean i mean multiplication and you sh you also know surely that when even when you don't write the dot when you write two things side by side it's understood that the dot is there and it, and, th and that it means multiplication okay so the definition of nx is x plus x plus x plus dot 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 plus x Okay. And how many times do you have to write x? n times. So there are n x's. Which is the reason why that's called n times x. Because how, how, many, how many occurrences of, how many, how many times does x occur? n, n times. Right? That's why it's called n times x. So for example, what is the definition of 3x? It's x, yeah, plus x, plus x. That's what it means. x plus x plus x. So million x means you take a million copies of x and add them all up. That's what it means. Okay, the second definition, 2, is that x to n, this means something. It, it, it has a definition. So what is the definition of x to n? Yes. It means x times x times x times dot 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 times x. And how, how many x's occurred? N of them occurred. So for example, uh, x to 4 means what? Yes, x times x times x times x. So this is the definition of those things. Now I know that it's essentially certain that you knew, you knew how to, you knew these expressions x to n before you, you got here, but we have to go through these definitions. And don't worry, we'll get to more interesting things soon. Okay, <clears throat> so any question about these definitions? Okay, so how about a proposition? Proposition means that now we're going to make a, we're going to make a conclusion that, it, that is a consequence of these definitions. So the first, the first one, how about uh, nx plus mx? And this is where x is real and n and m are natural. So what will this be? Yes, we'll have n plus m x. So why should this why should this be the case? Why should it be the case? Okay, so to restate to restate what you said, there's a common factor of x, so you factored it out. Okay, now I agree with that. However. Uh, you've got to understand the position we're in. We're going all the way back to the beginning. I don't even know what a common factor is. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? Of course you're right. Okay, but you're right as a consequence of these things that we haven't established yet. Okay, so why should this be the case? Well, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example to try and make it really clear. So 3x plus 4x. Okay, I suspect all of you can tell me what this is. What is it? 7x. It's 7x. In the same sense that if you have three apples <laughs> and, then, and then you add four more apples, <laughs> how many apples? Seven apples. Okay. Now, the reason why this is the case, the reason why this is the case is because what is the definition of 3x? It's x plus x plus x. And then what is the definition of 4x? x plus x plus x plus x. Plus x. Okay, now we can drop the parentheses. So that's x plus x plus x plus x plus x plus x plus x. And now it's just a matter of counting. How many x's are there? 
seven of them. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a shorter way to write that? Yes. Oh, that'd be terrific, right? We do, 7x, right? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why this is the case, the definition. It's a consequence of these definitions. By the way, why can you, uh, why can you drop the parentheses? Uh, I agree <laughs> with that, but that's not the reason why. Why they can all you have the same common factor? It's not that either, because I don't even know what that means. Oh right. <laughs> why? So I'm fishing for an A word. Addition. It's not that. Uh, uh, an A that one associative. All right. This is this is a word that the state of Texas assures me that you know. <laughs> associative. That means that you can drop these. You can drop the parentheses. Uh, for addition. Associ what does the word associate mean, generally speaking, not, not, when not used in a math? Yeah, it's specifically to group together. So what these parentheses are doing are grouping, right? These three are grouped together, those four are grouped together. But addition is associative, which means that you can group them together however you want. Okay. So, uh, good. Two. How about x to n multiplied by x to m. What will this be? Uh, x to the n. Yes. So for those of you who did something like this in grade school, you probably heard a phrase that went like this. When you are multiplying things of the same base, what do you do with the exponents? You add them. You add them. That, that's this from grade school. Now, why should this be the case? Because in grade school, it was just quoted to you, right? Like a commandment. Thou mm. shalt. <laughs> thou shalt add the exponents when bases be the same. Right? <laughs> or whatever. But, but there's a reason why. Why should this be the case? I'm, what was the first thing? <coughs> Are you saying logarithm? Yeah, like, yeah. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> What's a logarithm? I don't know. Like, when you do log, the opposites of exponent, then it's going to be the, you know, no mind. <laughs> well, when you do, what is x to n? What does that mean? X times x times x. X times x times x times x times x, n of them. And then when you follow, it, follow that by x to m, what does that mean? x times x times x times x times x. And if you, if you were to write that all out and then count them all up, how many x's are there? There's n of them, and then there's m more of them. There's n plus m of them, right? So for example, x cubed multiplied by x squared. Now, we all know because of this rule and because of our grade school experience, what is the answer? X to, X to 5. And if you see a question like this on the homework or wherever, you can just write that. And yeah, that's fine. But I want to make sure it's clear why this should be the case. Because x cubed multiplied by x squared is by definition x times x times x times x. Uh, sorry, x times x times x and then x times x. And then multiplication is also associative, which means that we can drop the parentheses. So this is x times x times x times x times x. But wouldn't it be nice if we had a shorter way to write that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be terrific, don't we? <laughs> this way. So the reason why you add exponents when you're multiplying things of the same base is a consequence of the definitions. Okay, any question about this one? Okay. So a few more things. So more proposition. So let X and Y uh, be real. and let n and m be natural. Uh, 
Okay. So the first one, the first one is how to define this negative n multiplied by x. So we don't have a definition for this, right? Because n is natural, that means that n is a positive number. And if we were to say it in the same way, right, when we said what's 3x, well, that's x plus x plus x. You make three copies of x, and then you add them all up. What about negative 4x? Does that mean you make negative four copies of x? What does that even mean, right? <laughs> I have negative four bananas. Four copies of x. Are four copies of negative x. So okay. this is, this is uh, by definition, n multiplied by negative x. So for example, negative three x means what, by definition? Plus, right? Negative x plus negative x plus negative x. That's what it means, the de the, by the definition. Okay. Similarly, uh, x to negative n. So, what is this going to mean? One over x. Right. So, just like. Okay, let, let's think about this for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> so, so notice that the, 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 the difficulty that we're dealing with is we want this front number, this number in the front, to be able to be an integer. But we only have definitions for it as naturals. So what I'm saying is that, well, this will work for any integer now. Because if it happens to be a positive integer, then it's natural, and it'll work. If this is a negative integer, then we just give the negative to the real. And then we have a natural, and it'll still work. So what I'm saying here is that we only have a definition for exponents that are natural. So what about negative integers? Well, the way this works is this is going to be, by definition, 1 over x to n. That's what it is. Because now the exponent is positive, and 1 over x is still real. So the way this is usually written, in fact, is like this, 1 over x to the n. Okay. So for example, please write x to negative 4 using only positive exponents. Um, yeah, so what is it? 1 over x to the power of Very good. 1 over x to 4. Okay, so re so really, what I I need to edit this. So this this was a proposition. I started to write proposition, but then I realized I needed to make definition. So change that to definition, and now we have a proposition. So proposition one is okay. How about uh, n x uh, plus in y. So this is different than the previous page. The previous page was when the coefficient in front, when the number in front was different. We said nx plus mx. So now I'm saying ny plus the same n x. Yes. So you can take this in and do this. But why should that be the case? So you know this from grade school, yes? Because this, this step right here, this is the definition. It, it, so if that, so. Let me say it like this. To, it, dep it just depends on how you think. To a mathematician, that's a totally sufficient statement. Oh, that's the definition. Okay. So it, if, you, if, you, um, if you don't like that, so notice, I'll say it like this. The way, that, the way it's usually described in grade school, this might help if I say this. The way it's usually described in grade school is that if you have, say, x, q, uh, x to negative 3, <laughs> x to negative 3 over 5. So currently, 
that x has a negative exponent. You can get it to have a positive exponent by moving it to the opposite position. So presently it's in the numerator. If you move it to the denominator, it will then have a positive exponent. So you could write it as 1 over 5x cubed. So moving it up and down changes the SIGN of its exponent. And I say SIGN when I'm talking about positive and negative because if you've ever taken trigonometry, you'll know that there's a function called sine. Oh, yeah. Sine and cosine and tangent and all that. And yeah. so I always say SIGN when I'm talking about positive and negative. Okay, now, so did I answer your question? Okay, so to this, why should this be the case? So I'll explain to you why this, so uh, that this should be the case. So how about uh, 3x plus 3y? Well, by definition, by definition, this is uh, x, 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 x plus x plus x, I mean to say, <laughs> plus y plus y plus y, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to take those and I'm going to reorder them. I'm going to say, well, this is x plus y plus x plus y plus x plus y. So I reordered them. Is it legal to, for me to reorder them? Yes. No, you're going to jail. <laughs> yeah, going to jail. So, so it, is, it is legal. Why is it a legal operation to reorder them? Now I'm fishing for a C word. What is it? Commutative, right? This is called the commutative property of the reals, which the state of Texas assures me you're familiar with. That means that you can, you can add, when you're adding numbers, you can add them in any order that you wish. Okay, now I'll parenthesize them. So this is xy, x plus y, plus x plus y, plus x plus y. So I added a bunch of parentheses. Is that legal? Yes. Yes, what is that called? The associative property. But this is the same thing three times in a row. Don't we have a nicer way to write that? There you have it. So that's the reason why that's the case. No, you don't ever have to write this down in your homework. But this is a university level math class, so you need to, you're, it's required of your instructor to show you the reason why everything in a math class. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, another one. How about, uh, how about this? Uh, two. Uh, xy to n. What should this be? I even used this on the first page when we were talking about the square root of 2. x to n, y to n. Now, why should this be the case? Okay, yes, I mean, you distribute that, but but that's not enough, right? Why, according to the definition, should this be the case? Because it's x to the n and y to the n multiplied by each other, and so it's yeah. Well, what does this mean? x, y in parentheses to n. That means you make x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y. And how many times do you? do you put xy in a product? Yes. In times. So you have xy, 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 xy. And now we want to put them in a different order. Right? We can commute that product to make it x, 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 y, 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 y. And how many x's are there? N. N of them. And how many y's are there? N of them. That's the reason why this is the case. Okay. So I'll not demonstrate that any further. Now, how about this x to n and then to m? So x to the power Yes. So when you, have, when you have exponents arranged like this, these, these exponents are said to be iterated. x to n and then to m, because iterated means one after another. So this is x to 
n multiplied by m is the new exponent. Now this one's slightly interesting, but it, the, the reason for it is the exact same counting argument that we've made. This will be the tenth time we've done this, this counting argument. So let's just do it for some specific examples. So how about x squared cubed? Well, according to, the, according to what's immediately above, what should the answer be? X to 6. But now let's, let's make sure that we understand exactly why that should be the case. According to the definition, this is x squared multiplied by x squared multiplied by x squared. And then what is x squared? x times x. So this is x times x times x times x times x times x. And then we can drop the parentheses and that's x times x times x times x times x times x. And now it's just a matter of counting. How many x's are there? Six of them. So the reason why you multiply exponents when you're iterating, it's not, it's not magic. It's not something that, that some people got together in, uh, 500 years ago and decided, like, what, just what are we going to do with exponents when they're iterated? We'll multiply them. That's what we'll do. No, it's a consequence of of these definitions. Okay, good. So let's have an example now that we have a bunch of these. So, for example, um, <clears throat> please write the following expression x to 7 divided by x to 4. So I didn't write this one down, but I think you can do it. So when you are when you are dividing things of the same base, let, let's back up. When you're multiplying th things of the same base, what do you do with the exponents? Add. Them. You add. So when you are di di right, when you're dividing things of the same base, what do you do? Subtract. Subtract. So what is this? Right. And I'll insert an intermediate step for those of you that um, this is newish to. So x cubed. When you get used to this, you just jump to the last step. Okay, how about what if I say y to 6 divided by y to 11, and I want you to write the result with only positive exponents. What do you think? Right. So you could write it like this. I'll write the intermediate steps y and then the exponent is 6 minus 11. 6 minus 11 is negative 5. I haven't satisfied the instructions. Why not? In fact, you wrote two of them. <laughs> right. Okay, so then how can I write this with, with, with only positive exponents? Good. Good. Any question about this? Okay, and the last thing that's in this style is something like this. How about x squared y cubed? over uh, z to the fifth. I want you to um, simplify this as much as possible. <sighs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> So how about it? So what does that 5 do? It goes to each of the individual pieces, right? So that would be x squared to 5, y cubed to 5, over z to 5. Can this be simplified further? Yes. How about, how about x squared to 5? What's that? X, x, to x to 10. Because those exponents are iterated. Oh, yeah. Right, good, OK. x to 10, and then how about this one? y to 15, and then z to 5. And then I could make it more interesting by making some of the exponents negative, and then you got to 
deal with that and you can imagine how entertaining that would be. Okay, so any question about this? <clears throat> okay, now I'm just going to make a remark because in because I've I've defined and proven the things that can be defined and proven in this class and now in the same sort of way that your grade school teacher sort of issued a commandment, right? Thou shalt add the exponents <laughs> or whatever. Now I have to do more or less the same thing and say that uh, the preceding things still work when n and m are real. That is to say, they don't need to be just integers. They can be, in fact, any real. Uh, so, for example, I could say, how about x uh, squared multiplied by uh, x to 0 0.5? So what will this be? That's 0 0.5. Yeah, x to 2.5, because you just add the exponents. Okay, so it still works, even when the exponents are not integers. It, and and every, every math major, anyway, undergraduate math major, has to go through th this process of defining things and then making prop propositions, uh, consequences. Math majors are sort of hazed in this way. They have to do that. <laughs> For, for real numbers and demonstrate that yes, in fact, these things do work for real numbers. So if you thought this was excellent, then, then take, some, take some further math courses. It'll be, it, get, just, it just gets better. Did you have a question? Yeah. What happens when you have to like add them? Like what do you adding, mean? Like, x squared plus x squared. Uh, so your question, I believe, is something like x squared plus x cubed like so, there's, there's no, nothing that you can do here. Okay. Because what x squared means, x squared means repeated product. x cubed means repeated product. There's nothing that, this is sum now. Okay. So th this is about products and this is a sum. So there's, they, don't, they don't mix, okay. if you take my meaning. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, okay, so now. To clear up one matter that is all that most um, students seem to have when they get to me in this course, so I'm going to write in two columns, left and right. Okay. So then, the meaning of one uh, of one x, one times x. That means you make one copy of x and add it together, right? The meaning of two times x. That means what? It means, yes, you make two copies, x plus x. 3x, what does that mean? x plus x plus x. Right. That's what it means. Now, I'd like to point something out, and that is that the horizontal space on either side of the equal sign is, is not the same, and that is totally not my style. <laughs> okay, but when I do that, that means that I'm saving that space to write something in there so that the horizontal space on either side of the equals will be the same eventually. That being said now, what does it mean then to write 0 times x? 1. Does that mean, it does, it's not 1. Wait, zero. 0. Why should it be 0? Right? So then, if, if 3x means make 3 copies of x, 7x mm -hmm. means, yeah, so 0x means make 0 copies of x. So another, another aspect of the definition is that there is an implicit 0 plus here, zero plus, zero plus, zero plus. So this plus, I guess I don't, I don't need it, but the rest of the pluses, I, I need them. So you start with zero. Okay. Now, because zero is the neutral element with respect to plus, adding zero is the same as doing nothing. So then, what is x to one? That means you do what? Make one copy of x and put it in our product. How about x to 2? What does that mean? 
and put them in product, x times x. And then x to 3 means x times x times x. That's what it means. So then how about then, notice I left myself a little space above, how about x to 0? What does that mean? Make zero copies of x and put it in a product? Okay, well, that, there's, an, there's an implied 1 in all of this definition. So this is 1 here, and 1 times this, and 1 times that, and 1 times that. So how about, what's a million to exponent 0? One. 1. Okay, what about a billion to exponent 0? Also 1, right? Okay, and this is true for any non-zero real. Right, 0 to 0 is undefined. Okay, and that's all we have for today. So have a, have a nice Wednesday.